starring Madeline Carroll in the Philip Barry play Tomorrow and Tomorrow on the Cavalcade of America, sponsored by DuPont, maker of better things for better living through chemistry. Tomorrow and Tomorrow, based on the play by the distinguished American playwright, Philip Barry. Here is the story of a woman torn by three shattering emotions, and of how, because she was a strong woman and a fine one, she refused to let them destroy her, but on the contrary, through them, achieved her own happiness and the happiness of those she loved. Now, DuPont, maker of better things for better living through chemistry presents Madeline Carroll in Tomorrow and Tomorrow on the Cavalcade of America. Our scene, the home of Gail and Eve Redman in the pleasant university town of Redmonton, named, incidentally, for one of Gail's grandfathers. As our curtain rises, Gail is just returning from an auto trip east to the annual reunion of his college class, an event Gail never fails to attend. It is an evening late in June of 1932. Eve. Eve, darling. Gail, is that you? You're back. Oh, hello, hello. Darling. <laughs> oh, Lord, it's good to be back. It seems forever, Gail. But I hardly dared expect you tonight. I drove straight through. Oh, oh am I tired? Of course you are. How was the reunion? Eve, it was a riot. You should have been there. You really do enjoy those reunions, don't you, darling? Sure, who doesn't? Oh, uh, they rigged up a basketball game between the seniors and the alumni. Mm -hmm. We won. Mm -hmm. I played center. The old wind's still pretty good. The old wind is superb. <laughs> <laughs> Some of the old class are really showing their years, though. Mm -hmm. Oh, oh, excuse me. Oh, of course, dear, you're tired. Sit down. What's been happening while I was away? Any news? Well, let's see. Oh, yes, President Aidy has announced a summer extension course at the college. Why is that news? Because I want to go. You do? Oh, Gail, I must do something. Somehow or other, I've got to find some way to... To what, dear? What's the matter? Oh, nothing. <laughs> in any case, the science department's got hold of a man who's done some remarkable work in psychiatry. See, uh, Dr. Nicholas Hay, I think his name is. Mm -hmm. He arrives tomorrow on the 9 o'clock. I said he could stay here with us. Eve, what on earth? Oh, he'll probably have whiskers and be very cranky, but it'll be nice to have someone to do for. Well, there's me, isn't it? You look out for yourself. You always have. Eve, you still love me, don't you, dear? I love Gail, so it must be you I love. Oh, that's a queer way to put it. Darling, you seem changed. What's happened? Nothing has happened. Well... For a uh... long time, nothing has, and for a long time, nothing will. That's what I found out. That's the change in me. I have nothing left to fight for. I don't get you at all when you talk this way. The Jessops had their baby Tuesday. Did they? A girl, a very small one. I should have a strapping boy with a broad high forehead and a mass of curly hair. That's the kind of baby I should have. We'll have someday. I hope it will be soon, Gail. We've been married almost six years now. Oh, lots of people wait a dozen. I'm getting scared. There are times I can't sleep for thinking of it. And I love children. <laughs> if loving children made you have them, I'd have a house full. Besides, I'd, I'd so love the actual having of one. I'd know then that I was living, making, and not slowly dying a little more each day like this. Heaven, shine on me. Rain on me. Bring something to me to hold in my arms. I love it tenderly. Only I shall look after it ever. Gail, listen to me. I'm speaking honestly. I must have a child, or in a while I shan't be good for anything at all. Help me to life, Gail. Hold fast to me with your two strong arms and bring me to it. Gail? Gail? Hmm? Oh, Lord, I must have dropped off. What were you saying, darling? It'll keep. No. Tell me. You're tired and it's late. Besides, I'm... I'm not altogether sure you'd understand. Excuse me. 
excuse me, but uh, I can't seem to find a taxi about. I wonder if you could tell me how to get to the Redmond house? Why, yes, I'm going there myself as soon as I find Professor... But surely you're not Nicholas Hay. I am indeed. And you must be Miss Redmond. How nice of you to come and meet me. In fact, how nice of your mother to ask me to stop with her. My mother? Oh! <laughs> I thought you'd be much older, too. <laughs> Great Scott, then you're Mrs. Redmond. Yes. <laughs> oh, really? Come along, bring your bags. The car's right here. Oh, thank you. It was nice of you thinking I was my daughter. Tell me what you expected. Well, tell me what you did. For some ridiculous reason, a beard. Oh, no. <laughs> I could never rise to that. <laughs> and what was I? Uh, quite large, a little flushed, and slightly out of breath. And I believe you sang when urged. <laughs> I think we're quit, don't you? So soon. <laughs> you know, you're quite lovely. What? I say you're lovely. But how nice of you to think that. Thank you. Oh, did I mention I was going to take your course? Miss Redmond will please see me after class. <laughs> You're not a bit old, really. How is it you know so much? Oh, I don't know anything. I have an idea that you know many obscure things well. And that is why you have... you have such grace about the plain things. Who on earth are you, anyway? I? Why? Why? Who do you think I am? I should like to know. It shouldn't be difficult. You see... I am one of the plain things. Oh, I'm so sorry. I, I'm disturbing oh, you. Not a bit of it. My own fault for working on the porch. Anyway, I've finished. There. Oh, it is hot, isn't it? Our weather certainly hasn't shown off to you these weeks you've been here with us. Where's Gail? I left him talking horses to a man. You know, there are only three things Gail really loves. Horses, corn soup, and me. Eve, don't move. Nicholas. I want this picture of you. I want to take the print of it as deeply as I can. What for? For afterwards. I sail for Europe Friday week. Two years in Vienna. My picture of you must last a long time. I think I shall miss you a great deal. Afterwards. What can one do for you? Do I seem to need something so much? Yes. That's quite true, Nicholas. But what is... I you? don't know. One thing, certain, you won't go looking for it, will you? You're quite content to stay on here forever. I live here. My life is here. If you can call it life. Seeing the neighbors, filling the house with children, I suppose. Would that be such a dreadful fate? Children. I see. I knew there was something. You're like an artist without an art. You mustn't make fun of me, Nicholas. Oh, but I'm not. Yes, it, it's quite plain now. A son. I see him with your eyes, your brow, and Gail's deep chest and straight back. It would be good. You'll be grave and solemn for a while, until things have grown familiar. Then he'll laugh out loud. He'll laugh a great deal. First sons do, you know. I hope. And you'll sing him to sleep at night. Frere Jacques, Frere Jacques. It's true. I believe he might be the answer for you. I should set great store by him. Then have one. Have one quickly. Or failing that, adopt one. I know it's right for you. Let's see now. We must have a name for him. Uh, Peter? David? No, no. Ah, I have it. Christian. Christian Redmond. Christian. Eve, what is it? Tell me. All that you said, you you were speaking almost as though as though it were your own baby. Eve, I've done it. Oh, hello, Nicholas. I've done it, Eve. Done what, Gail? Persuaded Marcus to sell me that roan stallion. And for guess how much? Only twelve hundred dollars. Is that a break or is that a break? It certainly is. Congratulations, Gail. Thanks. If you only knew how I've looked forward to this day. Eve can tell you how much it means to me. Yes, of course I can. And if this makes you happy, Gail, I'm glad for you. <laughs> Gail is sorry to miss your farewell supper, Nicholas. I'm sorry too, Eve. But he's going to take the midnight train down. He'll see you to say goodbye at breakfast, surely. To my host. And to my hostess, 
who has cared for me with all this care. To our most welcome guest. Eve. Nicholas? Why did you run away my last three days here? Well, I, I hadn't seen my aunt in such a long time. It seems to me Tell me, me the that... truth. I'm trying to. It seemed to me... Eve, this is my last night here. So talk to me honestly in the little time we have left. What shall I say? Say... Say what you look. Eve, I try to be an honorable man. I think you are a great and honorable man. Oh, my dear. From the first, from the moment I saw you, I didn't know what had hit me. Hush, don't think, Ethan. But I'm to be gone two years, at least two years. Nicholas. Eve, come with me. No, that I can't do. You love him, too? Yes. Yes, I love Gail. But this has nothing to do with him. My love for you has not. My going with you would. Then this is hail and farewell for us. But, Eve, if ever you send for me, whenever, whatever your reason, I shall come. Remember that. I shall remember. And when you do, you must be ready to go with me. Remember that as well. Yes, Nicholas. When I send for you, if ever I do, I shall be ready to go with you. You are listening to Tomorrow and Tomorrow, starring Madeline Carroll on the Cavalcade of America, sponsored by DuPont, maker of better things for better living through chemistry. As our play continues, eight years have passed. Gail and Eve Redman are with their son Christian, now seven years old. And on an afternoon of early autumn... And come down as soon as you're ready, Christian. The horses are waiting. Yes, Daddy. Gail, please, please don't do it. Don't make Christian ride again, at least not today. Now, Eve... How can you, Gail? That fall yesterday might have... Don't be ridiculous, darling. It takes three good falls to make a horseman. I'd had mine before I was his age. To anyone who loves horses, the important thing I is... I don't think he does love them. In fact, Gail, I'm, I'm sorry to tell you, but Christian has a deathly fear of horses. What? <laughs> a Redman afraid of horses? Gail, I don't want him to ride again, at least until he wants to. Please. No, you're on the wrong track with the boy, Eve. You always have been. I haven't wanted to say so, but... But what? Well, it's almost as though you were trying to make the kid... Different from ordinary boys. Boys like I was, for instance. Take the matter of teaching him yourself. Is that so bad? I worked pretty hard for my degree. But he can't even read or write yet. That's true, but they'll come so easily when they come. So far, he's been occupied with real things. What, for instance? He has a sense of, of the strangeness of the world and of himself in it. He... I'm talking about practical things. All right. He knows where the trout lies. How to make a telephone. He can grow things. Out of rock, it seems to me. I've seen him let a swarm of bees settle on his bare arm and bring them to a new hive. Very valuable in afterlife. He knows that Jesus lived and was a hero. He can lead you to a spring in any patch of woods. He can smell water. He knows how to. Uh, the difference between. And, and he can tell you why. Oh, there's so much that he knows, and it's all part of him. And, and he's... He's yellow. What? I said he was yellow. That's why he failed that jump yesterday and fell. That's why he's going to make it today. My son, yellow. Now you've got it. Yes. Now I've got it. I'm ready, Daddy. All right, Christian. Down the field and straight for the head. Yes, Father. Gail, how can you? The boy was trembling, actually white and trembling. Nonsense. Look at him come. That's riding, Eve. Give him his head, Christian. Don't flinch. Up and over, boy. Look at that. Over by two feet. He's got in having the horse. Jump clear, Christian. Jump! Ah! But, Doctor, what's to be done? You said a week ago that if Christian's fever broke... He'd be all right. And so I thought. This, this coma, there's no accounting for. Frankly, I'm baffled. And so are the best men I've been able to call in for consultation. But surely there's... There's something to be done. Perhaps. But we don't know what. 
He's getting weaker each day, and I'm afraid if we can't get through to him soon, well, it's just a matter of time before... Oh, uh, oh, the phone. Just a minute. Yes? Yes, Mrs. Sadie? Who? No, I didn't know. Thank you. Gail, Nicholas Hay. He's back in this country. Mrs. Sadie just heard him on the radio from Chicago. Nicholas Hay? Oh, yes, that professor who stayed with us. Yes, if he were here now. If ever you send for me, whenever, whatever your reason, I shall come. Remember that. Eve, what is it? If Nicholas were here. But when you do, you must be ready to go with me. Eve, what's wrong? You look so strange. Nothing, darling, nothing. Operator, I want to call Chicago, person to person, to a Dr. Nicholas Hay. And it's urgent, Operator. It's terribly, terribly urgent. You can reach me. Oh, Nicholas, Nicholas, to have you here, strong, sure. Eve, Eve, my darling, I'd have come across the earth. Hold me just for a moment. Then tell me the truth. Will Christian get well? I don't know. The other doctors are right when they say there's no apparent physical reason for the continuance of this coma. So there's only one answer. A deeper reason within the boy himself. I've no doubt we'll find the trouble so simple it will break your heart. Oh, Nicholas. The most horrible thing has just come over me. If this is true, it's I who have done it, no one else. Hey, what are you saying? It's true. Loving you, I've always been trying to keep him from Gale. He's been pulled this way, that way, never knowing why, until at last he... Oh, poor child, poor baby. Eve, I don't know I see it all now. Loving both Gale and me, he tried to be what each of us wanted. Now he feels that he is neither, that he's failed us both, and it's... It's too much. Too much for his little seven years. Yes, Eve, this may be it. And if it is... Nicholas, what? You and you alone can solve it. Go into Christian Eve, now. Whisper softly the things he must hear. Tell him you and Gail love him, are proud of him. Give him that confidence and will to live he must have to break through to us. Do you really believe I can? It's the only way. I'll try, Nicholas. I'll try. Christian, can you hear me, darling? It's Mummy. I know a little curly-headed boy, the dearest little boy, who knows where the trout lie. He can find the prettiest flowers in the field, the sweetest fruit and berries. This little boy has been away, and his mother and daddy just don't know what to do without him. Do you know where he is, Christian? <laughs> His mother and daddy love him, darling. They need him to show them, oh, so many things. His daddy says that, that if he'll come back, he won't have to ride horses ever again unless he wants. Mommy and daddy are sad, and, and will surely be very much sadder if their little boy doesn't come back soon. Christian, darling, where is our little boy? I'm here, Mommy. <laughs> You're coming back to us, aren't you, darling? You see, Mommy and Daddy just couldn't get along without their boy, could they? Uh-uh. Mommy, sing to me. Frere Jacques, Frere Jacques, Dorez-vous, Good Lord, hey, how can I ever begin to thank you? Don't try. I understand. Not having a child of your own, you couldn't quite. But having had this most dreadful experience, I... 
Well, I realize more than ever that my life exists only in Eve and Christian. If anything ever happened to one of them, or... I know. I know. you got to come in here, huh? Your son is paging you, Gail. So I hear. I'm coming, Christian. Oh, uh, and doctor, it goes without saying that you're eternally welcome in this house. Thanks, Redmond. I'll remember that. Well, Eve, my sweet, the decision can't wait longer. I know, I know. You said that if I ever sent for you, I should be ready to go with you. My darling, any part I may have had in Kristen's recovery must have nothing to do with what you decide. Well, my dear? I can't decide it alone, Nicholas. I've walked my feet off trying, telling myself, oh, please, you must help me. What have you been telling yourself? First and always, that I love you as no one was ever loved before. That in some way I had learned to get on without you. And that if I'm to go with you, it must be truly with you now, this afternoon. The car leaves for the station in ten minutes. So short, terribly short for a lifetime. If I go, it will break Gail's heart. To say to him, look, you, your wife for eight years, she has really been in love with another man. It would destroy him. And me? Heaven's own judgment would not destroy you, Nicholas. Well, Eve? You are the wise one, you say. For years we have loved each other. That is the truth. No, that is the fact. It may be that the truth is simply that I'm Gail's wife and my place is here. Then... It's somehow, just as it is, it, it's so complete. You've decided. Yes. You were never really not decided. I think that's true. I want to think so. Eve. God bless you, my darling. And you, my dear. Don't you see? Don't you see that, that even if there weren't Christian, if I didn't love us, you and me, I simply couldn't. Gail needs me so. And you need no one? No, not anymore. You have yourself now. That, too, you've given me. And I'll always love you for it. Goodbye, Nicholas. My darling. And thank you. Thank you, Madeline Carroll. Ladies and gentlemen, in a few moments, Miss Carroll is to return to our microphone. But first, here is Gane Whitman with some interesting information. Our story of chemistry, working for the victory we mean to have, is once again a story of saving the most precious thing in the world today, time. And this time saving is concerned with a material vital to all people, all nations, wool. Textile mills in weaving woolen cloth have to add a spinning oil to the wool to make it travel more smoothly through the loom. The oil must, of course, be removed before the cloth is bleached or dyed. And until recently, it was washed out with soap and water. The cloth got wet, the spinning oil was lost, quite a lot of heat was needed to dry the soaked cloth, and more important, time, precious minutes and hours were required that we can ill afford to lose when every minute and hour saved counts. Partially because of the work of DuPont chemists and chemical engineers, the old method of degreasing woolens is on its way out. Several woolen mills are already using a dry cleaning process in place of the old wet wash. Today, thousands of yards of material are sewn together to make an endless belt. Thick or thin, it makes no difference. The endless belt runs through tanks of a DuPont product, a chemical compound that dries up oil the way water dissolves sugar. The woolens come out of this solution clean and dry, ready for bleaching or dyeing. Come out at the rate of a mile an hour, enough for 10 uniforms every minute. Time is saved because the goods aren't water soaked, helping to make more possible sooner. Expense is saved because less heat is required to dry the material. Space is saved for the whole process can take place in one-fifth or even one-tenth as much space as was needed before. Material is saved because the goods don't shrink. The valuable spinning oil is recovered from the solution. On a cavalcade program not long ago, we told you what these chemicals mean in speeding up the cleaning of metals. Wherever metal must be absolutely clean before it is finished, the new solvents are doing the job as it has never been done before. 
Machine tools, mining equipment, airplane motors, rifles and machine guns are only a few of the things that are coming off assembly lines faster because of the characteristic way in which certain chemicals drink up oil. Now, this same principle of cleaning has been applied to the weaving of woolen goods with the same time-saving results. For the duration of the war, they promised great savings in needed materials, plus greater efficiency and speed of production. And when the day comes when the war is at an end, they promise us an entirely new method of handling woolens. On that day, these solvents will assume their full stature as one of DuPont's better things for better living through chemistry. And now it is my pleasure to introduce to you again our star of the evening, Miss Madeline Carroll. Thanks, Mr. Houston. And thank you, ladies and gentlemen. It's always nice to be invited back to the DuPont Cavalcade of America. That character of Eve Redman and her great love of children reminds me that you have a sort of special interest in children, don't you, Miss Carroll? Oh, yes. You're no doubt referring to the evacuated French children I took into my home near Paris at the beginning of the war. How many children did you take under your wing, Miss Carroll? Oh, I should say about 200. 200? You're very brave. <laughs> Oh, I don't know, but there were times when I felt like the old lady who her times when I felt like the old lady who her times when I felt like the old lady who her times when I felt like the old lady who lived in a shoe. But seriously, I'm hoping and praying for the day when I shall see them all well and happy and free again. Good night. Good night, Madeline Carroll, and thank you. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, next week, Cavalcade will present another of America's fine actors, James Cagney a special new radio preview of an exciting new Warner Brothers motion picture soon to be released, an epic of aviation, Captains of the Clouds. On tonight's program, Madeline Carroll appeared through the courtesy of Paramount Pictures, for whom she is currently starring in the Technicolor production, Bahama Passage. The original musical score was composed and directed by Robert Armbruster. Don't forget next week's date with Jimmy Cagney in another of his fine roles as Captain of the Clouds on The Cavalcade of America. Your announcer is John Heaston, sending best wishes from DuPont. The greatest birthday present we can send to the White House in our President's Diamond Jubilee birthday celebration is our dimes and dollars, for he began the fight against the enemy of America's children, infantile paralysis. So give to your local campaign. Join our President's Diamond Jubilee birthday celebration. Fight infantile paralysis. This is the Red Network of the National Broadcasting Company. <laughs>